Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NYU Returns webinar on academics. My name is Katia Ba, and I'm a sophomore at NYU School of Nursing. And with me today, we have Gigi Dopico, Vice Provost for Undergraduate Academic Affairs and the Humanities, Jean Jarrett, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and Clay Shirky, Vice Provost for Educational Technologies. And Vice Provost Dopico, Dean Jarrett, Vice Provost Shirky, thank you so much for joining us. And can you each take a moment to describe your offices and roles? Sure. Thanks so much, Katia. Um, so as, as you said, I'm the uh, Vice Provost for Undergraduate Academic Affairs, which includes um, working with all our amazing undergraduate deans and our schools and faculty on everything having to do with the undergraduate curriculum. And uh, in that capacity, I'm very lucky to get to work with uh, uh, Dean Jarrett and uh, my colleague, uh, Clay Shirky. And yes, thank you, Katia. And I'm uh, Clay Shirky. I am the Vice Provost for Educational Technologies, which is really the, I deal with the academic issues any place the internet or digital technologies touches the teaching and learning enterprise. And my name is Gene Jarrett. I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Science, and uh, I'm also a professor in the English department. Uh, we have about uh, 7,500 students in the college, spanning 60 majors and 60 minors that underwrite uh, the liberal arts education that we provide for our uh, undergraduate students. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you all. Um, so I'd like to remind our viewers that we'll be starting off with questions that were submitted in advance. And we'll also be taking questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please click the Q&A button. And we'd like to remind you that we'll only be answering questions about undergraduate academics today. So if anyone asks a question that would be better answered in a future webinar session, please know that we'll pass those questions along to the panelists. So let's get started. So our first um, pre-submitted question is, how are classes coded as in-person, remote, or blended? How was the modality of the courses decided? Sure, so, so I'll start uh, on this one, Katia and uh, uh, Jean and Clay, feel, feel free to, uh, to jump in. Uh, classes are coded as in-person or line, online or blended, depending on, on how instruction is gonna be offered. Now, the decisions on modality were made with two key priorities in mind. On the one hand, uh, health and safety, how to be able to maintain the six foot physical distancing per New York State guidelines, and also accommodate members of the faculty with, with health concerns that would make it uh, impossible for them to, to teach in person. The second key priority is academic excellence. Now, considering what disciplines, which classes are best suited to different modes, we've seen a lot of really amazing pedagogical innovations over the last few months and opportunities that remote teaching has created, and also how to provide options and flexibility for students' continued academic progress, where they're, whether they're planning uh, to study on campus here in New York or, or to study remotely and, and take their classes from elsewhere. Um, I, I don't know if it's helpful. I'm happy to provide just a brief overview of each of those modalities, or uh, we could get to that later, whatever. Uh, you prefer? Um, I think that would be good. Uh, it's definitely related to the question, so definitely. Sure, sure. So in-person classes are just what they sound like. They are all in-person instruction. Those will be primarily smaller discussion-based seminar style classes, including many of our writing the essay or expository writing seminars, literature seminars, math classes, a lot of the recitations or discussion sections for the large lecture courses. Uh, most of our clinical placements in nursing, among others, are gonna be offered uh, in person with students trained in appropriate safety protocols and use of personal protective equipment. Our bench science lab courses will be in person. And there will also be some, some medium-sized lectures that will be offered in person as well. Online classes are fully remote instruction, whether the course meets at a designated time. And this is something that uh, my colleague Clay Shirky has taught me the uh, uh, right language for. So these are synchronous classes, or whether those classes are more self-paced, which are asynchronous classes, and students can take those at any time, or 
in most cases, a combination of, of the two. And even though those classes will be wholly online, students will have opportunities for regular engagement with the, with the professor and often even in-person engagement with, with the professor, uh, in some cases in smaller tutorials. Most of our large lecture courses, intro to psych, intro to sociology, microeconomics, bio, chem, data science, as well as a number of our core courses will be in an online modality to de-densify classroom spaces now with that health and safety priority. Um, and a lot of those will have co-requisite in-person uh, recitation sections. And finally, our blended classes consist of a mix of in-person and online instruction. Most of them will function on a rotational basis with 50% of students attending the class in person one week and online, whether synchronously or asynchronously the following week. And in some cases, the whole class will rotate between in-person and online, uh, or there'll be, you know, just other models of, of blended, but for the most part, it's 50-50. I should say that regardless of modality, every class will make remote attendance possible for students who are needing to study remotely for all or part of the semester. Uh, students who plan to attend remotely for the entire semester should probably first look for online classes since those are better suited uh, for remote attendance and are simply asked to consult with their advisors to make sure that the courses they're considering are well suited for, for remote st study. Thank you so much. Um, so our next question is, how do I find out if my classes are remote or blended? Yeah, so I will, uh, I'll take that kind of thank you. Um, the labels in person blended and remote are all available in Albert with the class under instruction mode. Uh, students can also see it in the instruction mode and location column in your class schedule in the Albert Student Center. Um, you can use the instruction mode filter in Albert to specifically look for classes coded that way. As Gigi said, if you are going to be remote from the campus, you may have a preference for uh, looking for online classes first. Uh, and the, uh, the instruction mode filter in Albert will let you not just see what the label is on classes, but actually actively search uh, for classes in those three modes, uh, remote, blended, uh, and in-person. Okay, thank you. Um... So our next question is going to be, if my classes are blended, will I have the option of entirely remote attendance if I'm not returning to campus? We kind of answered that. but just Yeah, Gigi answered that question already, but let me just emphasize it here because it has come up more than once in these questions and the answer is yes. Um, we are uh, making remote attendance. That's odd. I didn't realize my video had stopped. My apologies. Uh, we are making remote attendance uh, available uh, for students for all classes. But as Gigi said, uh, since remote classes will be specifically designed for uh, both remote instruction and remote attendance, students should talk to their advisors about their choices. Uh, but if there is a class that you need to make progress uh, towards a major and so forth, and you cannot be in campus, you can attend that class remotely, whatever the mode. Okay, thank you. Um, so our next question is, can any student opt to take all remote classes, even if the class they wish to take is offered as blended for any reason, or must they provide a doctor's note? Once again, I kind of think we answered this, but that would be... No, no doctor's note needed. <laughs> yes. but, but please do talk to your advisors. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question will be, will remote classes be taught synchronously or asynchronously? Will even the live classes all be recorded? So the, there are several questions in this, uh, in this domain, and I think I can, I can sort of take, take the three of them in, in, in turn, County, but um, most remote classes uh, will be a mix of synchronous and asynchronous. There will be some materials uh, that are assigned to students to, to do at your own pace during the week, and then some live check-in. One of the things we learned from the spring COVID conversion, as it were, is that faculty adapt these tools to the particular uh, particular needs and models of the course. And we expect that, uh, in fact, we know in the fall from, from seeing how they're approaching the issue already, um, that individual faculty members will be choosing sort of 
tools and modes that are fit to the subject of the course as well as to uh, the, the, the mode of the class. Um, in general, we're encouraging faculty to record the parts of the course that involve faculty lecturing or otherwise delivering or explaining material. Um, however, we also know from spring that some students uh, may not be comfortable being recorded. So there's no universal requirement for recording. This, this then becomes a, a question of faculty judgment. Um, if you have particular concerns or needs about access to recording or about not wanting to be recorded, uh, you should bring them up with a faculty member uh, at the beginning of the semester. Okay, sounds great. So the next question we have is, what provisions are being made for students taking synchronous remote classes who do not live in the time zone that the class is being offered? Right, and this is essentially a follow-on to the to the previous answer. Um, again, as uh, as faculty get a sense of sort of who is where uh, in their classes, um, they are being given tools and techniques and guidance for creating asynchronous materials that students can work on on their own time, uh, and where material is being produced live, they're being encouraged to record it or otherwise capture it and, and to distribute it to students who may be in time zones that are effectively inside out from, uh, from New York time. Got it. Clay, do you want to also talk a little bit about um, the ability of students to register for courses um, offered from time zones closer to where they may be? Yes, that's the, this is, this is part of the, um, uh, the, and so NYU's global network obviously offers classes in multiple places and both Abu Dhabi and Shanghai have online courses as well. So you may in, uh, in searching for classes in Albert find courses that are, that are, in, those, uh, that are in those time zones. Um, and again, this is a matter for your advisor because of course you were, as you would do if you were registering across schools, you would be signing up for courses in say, both the College of Arts and Sciences and the undergraduate section uh, in Shanghai. But those courses will be visible to you in Albert and, uh, and will have time zones that may be more, uh, more convenient for, for many of the students who are remote from the New York campus. Okay, sounds good. Um, so our next question is, for larger classes that are online, is it possible to have the class broken up into smaller cohorts? where the students can focus on studying for exams together or getting individual questions answered? I'll answer this question. We've, had, we've historically had certain large classes that are per se popular among students or on the other hand, for example, crucial to students' navigation through specified requirements in popular disciplines. But we have focused especially on attaching a host of recitation sections to large courses so that students and faculty can engage each other in more intimate settings. Tutorials or office hours in which student learning can be even more intimate have also been enhanced to ensure that students can get the information they need on a regular basis or under special circumstances. Okay, sounds good. Um, so our next question would be, uh, can we register for multiple remote only classes that are offered at the same time? Sure, I will be happy to take this. So if uh, classes are being offered uh, either overlapping or conflicting meeting patterns, and Albert will prevent students from registering for those um, conflicting meeting patterns. Uh, th that would really only work if online classes were 100% asynchronous and our understanding is that from schools is that most of them are not. No, so keep in mind, especially that smaller online classes such as seminars have expectations for active student participation during meeting times. So it's not, not advisable to, uh, to register for classes uh, offered at the same time. Okay, great. Um, the next question we kind of brushed over a little bit, but it's will the in-person sessions of blended classes be live streamed? The, this is a, a, again the same uh, rough answer. We have um, we've encouraged faculty to use video um, in that way, and particularly for blended classes, where by definition not the entire class is in attendance. Um, it can be live streamed or it can be produced as recorded material, but there will obviously be ways for students not in the classroom uh, for any given blended course meeting uh, to keep up with the material. Okay, great. 
Um, the next question is, how will faculty know what students are taking a course remotely if the course is blended in person? So students who are planning to be fully remote in the fall will be asked to let us know in August and this information will be captured in Albert. So uh, in addition, class rosters in Albert that faculty use are going to uh, be updated to include this information, whether they're uh, going to be remote the whole semester, whether they're studying at a go local sites and some of those students um, studying at uh, who's, who live close to a study away site and are studying at that study away site will still be taking some remote classes from uh, New York. And if a student is going to be in New York but wants to take a particular in-person course remotely, they just need to let their faculty member know. Okay, sounds good. Um, so our next question is, what provisions are being made for classes that do not translate well to remote instruction, such as dance, drama, music, fine arts, laboratory science, and engineering? Sure. Jean, do you want to start talking a little bit about what's happening in the college, and then maybe I'll talk a little bit beyond that? Sure. Um, Vice Provost um, Topico. Uh, in CAS, which amounts a diverse curriculum taken by students across the university, we do have courses that normally anchor to special in-person or physical interactions or interactions for which allocated space is crucial. I'm thinking of the laboratory sciences where students normally encounter experiments or in courses involving interpersonal engagement in the context of musical or dramatic performance. Uh, although the provisions of physical distancing have prompted us to amend those arrangements, we've succeeded in developing ways of preserving the learning outcomes of such courses, ranging from the online simulations and the low density student attendance of laboratories to the potential relocation of activities to large spaces that can accommodate the physical distancing required between and among faculty and students. Our belief is that these strategies can avail the required measures of keeping everyone safe while underscoring the opportunities of intellectual and within reason interpersonal engagement within the course. Thanks. Sure, and I'll, I'll add, just add to that. I'll start by saying that NYU faculty have been amazingly creative and innovative, coming up with, with new forms of teaching to help translate even those disciplines that may not on the surface seem like they're particularly well suited for remote instruction and being able to, to deliver that, you know, those lessons in, in different and, and really creative ways. Um, but for the fall, the fact that we're offering classes in three different modalities means that many of those areas where in-person academic experiences seem especially crucial will in fact be able to be offered in person. So I'll pick up, you know, Jean spoke about, Dean Jarrett uh, spoke about the, um, the lab classes, for instance, in CIS. Uh, in tandem, two labs will be uh, either in person or blended. You know? So for blended lab courses, there's going to be several options at tandem, depending on the specific course. Students who attend in person will perform their experiments as, as usual. For those who are remote, they may be getting uh, kits uh, so that they can carry out those experiments or analogous ones at home or a lab partner might do some of the work um, and they might be paired that way uh, via different kinds of connections. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of overview um, across the schools, clinical placements and Katia in your own school. Um, so for nursing, for dentistry, for Silver School of Social Work, for a number of programs in Steinhardt for global public health, um, those placements will largely be held in person, obviously following strict um, health and safety protocols, uh, training, and uh, use of, of PPE. Um, Steinhardt's Department of Occupational Therapy have come up with um, an intensive workshop model, so students are going to have uh, lectures online throughout the semester and then intensive all-day experiences like a pediatric lab days, mental health days, um, so that they're able to, to do problem-based learning in small groups in person. 
um, simulations also for, for labs um, will combine uh, in person and include maybe uh, use of educational theater students as patient actors. Um, Steinhardt Nutrition Food Studies is going to use the department's farm on Houston um, for a variety of classes that will combine remote lectures and in-person recitations on, uh, on the farm. Uh, at Tisch, undergraduate drama is going to be fully online in the fall. Coronavirus, one of the things that has come out of it, in addition to new forms of teaching, is of course new forms of art and in particular remote theater, as well as new opportunities for training among theater artists uh, across the world. So remote Tisch drama studio classes are being designed to ensure that students are fully engaged with new approaches that are being developed and there will be a series of remote productions in the fall that will also include a number of networking opportunities. The high quality that Tisch Drama is known for will absolutely be maintained. And to ensure this first and second year students who are in studio are gonna take advantage of NYU's flexible semester options this year to take an intensive three week session immediately following the spring semester that will culminate in an in-person production. And that three week session will be uh, in person uh, probably late May. Uh, recorded music will have blended classes using their recording studios so students can be rotating into studios, uh, whereas some of the more academic classes will be held online, but they will, uh, students will absolutely have access to production. Um, for film and TV, the vast majority of undergrad film and TV classes will be blended. So a lot of the instruction will take place online, but there will be uh, many opportunities for students to connect with faculty uh, and other students in person. In general, COVID has paused film and TV production around the world, uh, and where they're beginning to reopen very slowly, it's under very strict um, conditions. So film. Uh, Tisch film is no exception. All advanced level production classes for the fall are going to focus on pre-production and script development with a view for full production as soon as the current pause is lifted. For freshmen, um, and this will include the fundamentals and the intermediate level production classes, students are going to be using their own equipment, cell phones, tablets, DSLRs, to film projects under guidelines that align with uh, CDC state um, health and safety measures. Tisch Dance is gonna hold ballet and contemporary dance classes in person. Um, seven to eight students will be dancing in large studios that are made to accommodate many more in order to be able to maintain physical distancing. And as in every in-person and blended class, those students will be using um, face masks. Um, I, that's just kind of an overview of some of the different areas where the in-person is, is really working sort of in complement to the blended and, and the online courses. Thank you so much. You gave like a lot of clear answers. I feel like a lot of us were wondering. So thank you. Um, so our next question is, how is the university going to ensure that the quality of courses online are equal to, if not greater, than how the courses would have been guided or taught in person? Thanks, uh, I think I'll take this one and it's not um, an easy answer to give. Uh, the, the university and faculty in particular have been looking at the learning outcomes supported by educational technology for a long time. Certainly this past spring semester due to the COVID pandemic, we as a community had no choice but to transition to remote interaction and instruction by leveraging a host of software platforms, ranging from Zoom, as you know, to those facilitating the ability of faculty to assess students, students remotely. Despite this transition, our long-term goal has been to ensure that the courses we teach, or more broadly, the curricular and co-curricular experiences we deliver at NYU, can enable students to achieve their academic and professional goals. I should point out that the nature and impact of courses can run the gamut. Uh, we have actual examples in which we've heard students provide within the context of classroom environments that have been remote or at least blended, which um, Provost Dobiko had pointed out. 
uh, at least four positive kinds of feedback. First of all, uh, these students have valued the afforded flexible opportunities to learn material to engage with professors and classmates in new ways. Uh, secondly, uh, these students have felt more comfortable participating in class due to the diversity of interpersonal options for intellectual exchange. Uh, we've also heard uh, students regard scheduling options as more robust in helping them fulfill general and major requirements. And, and, and last, uh, students have also enjoyed a wider array of assignments than they initially expected. So if I may, I don't necessarily um, uh, agree with the premise sometimes implied that the quality of online courses necessarily struggles to achieve the quality of in-person courses, uh, quite the contrary. I believe we've entered a crucial inflection point in teaching and learning at the university where the tools of uh, educational te technology are at our disposal uh, and when the possibilities of student engagement have been widened unlike ever before. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and once again, I feel like we kind of went over this, but just for clarity, um, another question is, when will instructors and instruction modes be assigned for the remaining courses like labs? So most of the modalities are already assigned. There are some still as we're, as we're working with um, the New York State guidelines and with the classroom capacity uh, to change them. So students uh, registration reopened for continuing students uh, about a week and a half ago and for first year students uh, on Monday. So students should just keep checking their schedules if, if they would like to change, if they're gonna be in person in New York and they wanna be taking more in-person classes, uh, if they're gonna be fully remote and they wanna search for more online classes, they should just keep checking. But for the most part, uh, the modalities should be finalized over the next few weeks. Okay, sounds good. Um, so our next question is, how, will, how flexible will professors be and what are some things being implemented in the classroom that will cause professors to be less rigid or more understanding about the constantly changing reality of COVID-19? Thanks, Katya. I think I'll answer this one too. Uh, we've learned remarkable lessons from the past spring semester. This summer, we've been preparing precisely to ensure that in the fall, we'll be as flexible as possible. Faculty have already experienced a transition from in-person to remote instruction last academic year. And this experience has encouraged them uh, even more to be less rigid if more understanding about what's at stake in ensuring the excellence of undergrad education. COVID-19 has altered the way all of us have been approaching the world. Uh, no less has undergrad education adjusted to these changing and complex circumstances of our times. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and so our next question is, is there a specific resource center that students will be able to call if they are struggling with the NYU returns process regarding academics? Sure, I actually just uh, answered a, a question on the uh, question chat. Uh, if a, a student should start with their school advisor uh, with about any questions concerning the returns guidelines, but in addition, uh, students have the uh, resource of the Office of Student Success and uh, the uh, uh, email address is studentsuccess at nyu.edu and they should feel free to reach out to one of the advisors there. Thank you. And I'll add to, uh, I'll build upon um, uh, uh, this answer to talk specifically about the schools and segue outward into talking about the more university-wide resources. Um, all undergraduate schools, um, all undergraduate students should remember that a range of academic support exists within respective schools, such as at the level of professional academic advisors or within departments at the level of faculty advisors. NYU Returns overall is designed to give a big picture view of what the fall has in store for educating and supporting our students. Uh, but the more focused resources inside include the curricular advice on coursework, the co-curricular exper experiences of how to 
acculturate to university life and at the broader institutional level, places such as the University Learning Center, also known as ULC, and the Wasserman Center for Career Development, uh, which provide added bolstering of academic and professional skills uh, with an eye toward future opportunities. Uh, these are the kinds of support systems that have long been in place for our students and they remain with us today prepared to um, acclimate students to uh, NYU. So uh, as um, stated, you should contact your school's dean's office and or your department advisor as a first step. I'm sorry, are you, I don't know. If you... Oh yes, I'm done, thank you. Sorry, and of course I was on mute. Um, it's not really a Zoom call until someone starts talking while the mute button is still on. But let me just add that there is a, um, uh, for students particularly facing issues around connectivity, students studying remotely and particularly facing issues around connectivity, uh, there is a uh, an NYU COVID-19 emergency relief fund, um, which you can apply for help to, particularly for technology and connectivity related issues. Uh, students enrolled in fall 2020 can start applying for this in August. Uh, the funds are limited, so uh, you should only apply. This is, you should only apply if you have real, uh, real need, a real, a real issue with either the hardware you would be using or the connectivity. Um, I don't know, given that I think I'm limited to the QA interface, how to get the URL to you. I'm going to, I guess I will send it to Katia and Katia, if you, if there's any way that you can then broadcast it to uh, uh, the, the, the people attending just to make sure everybody has, uh, has the link for the COVID-19 emergency relief fund. Okay, um, I think it's already in the chat now, but um, if need be, I can definitely. Uh, okay, great. Link. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Nick has got it. Um, so our last pre-submitted question is, what is this group doing to ensure that we don't exacerbate disparate impact on the most vulnerable communities within NYU? Sorry, Connie. Um, so, so I'll start, and I'm going to invite uh, Jean and and Clay to to join. Uh, I I think the resource that Clay just mentioned is an important one. Now, what we heard in uh, in the spring in terms of students who felt sort of the disparate impact of the switch to remote that NYU was was forced to do in mid March was, for example, that some students had um, really poor Wi-Fi connections or did not have uh, the tech that they needed to be able to keep up with, uh, with classes. So um, being, being able to make use of those emergency um, funds and or to um, really uh, provide students with whatever technology needs uh, they have is is one of the key ways that I think we're, we're looking to uh, make sure that that um, inequities aren't exacerbated. Uh, another inequity we, we heard of was, of course, international students uh, who couldn't be here and the question of how to keep up with uh, remote classes if you're in a time zone that is you know, many hours forward or back. Uh, I think a lot of um, your earlier questions really get at, at those issues you now in terms of offering as many modalities and as many forms of support as possible um, in terms of the flexibilities. I'll, I'll add one, one more which we talked about or I talked about just in passing and it is the flexible tuition grants that we have made available. So if a student finds that they need to take a lighter course load uh, this fall as you know, in, in order to somehow mitigate the, the impact of all this, um, one of the things they can do is basically shift some of their, um, some of their credits and take uh, a, effectively a free course in either J term or the summer. And there's, I will also send you so that you can uh, maybe broadcast um, 
the website for that for those flexible tuition grants. So if a student registers, say, for 12 credits instead of 16, he or she could take a, uh, a four credit course over J term or over the summer. If they decide to do that again uh, in the spring, there's also um, flexibility there. The website is uh, www.nyu.edu um, slash students slash flex. And uh, I'll think about, I'll, uh, I'll also add to um, some of these points raised about how not to exacerbate um, inequities. Um, I should point out that, you know, NYU has played a, a key role in addressing uh, inequities in the social distribution of our resources. Um, as the question implies, we have a, a diversity of student backgrounds. And as such, uh, a number who come from underrepresented or underserved backgrounds may have uneven access to uh, the great academic resources they need to be successful and to uh, achieve their full uh, potential. The thing that I would point out is that, you know, by joining us in, in the fall, um, students will have access to a full range of resources that do not necessarily exist in uh, many parts of the world. And so not only academic resources, but social resources and cultural resources, and medical resources, the constellation of opportunities that um, can establish the sense of belonging students have to communities and the ways in which they can thrive in a uh, academic and social environment that's afforded by uh, NYU. Uh, and some of these things are mediated by um, access to proprietary information to proprietary resources to you know, something as basic as university Wi-Fi uh, resources to access to um, faculty. And so by remaining ensconced in the uh, NYU community, uh, access to these resources remain uh, relatively direct and insured. And so that's one of the, the great reasons that um, students have pointed to, and families as well, in joining us at NYU in fall. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just. And, Cody, was that? Oh yeah. I'm sorry. I was just saying. I think that was the last of the prepared questions. Is that right? Yeah, I was going to just thank everyone who um, already pre-submitted questions. And so now we still have a little bit more time for um, the panelists to answer any questions from the live Q&A, if anyone has. Great. There are, so there are a couple of questions about office hours. Office hours will work very much like what we're doing now. The faculty member will post office hours. Typically, uh, what a faculty member will say is, here's the scheduled office hours or by appointment. Obviously, by appointment may be a little bit more complex given the time zone issues. Uh, but in general, for office hours with your faculty, you would just schedule uh, a one-on-one -on -one video conference uh, or if you prefer, audio conference. Um, and then I think there was a question of whether or not courses would switch modes during the semester from either uh, remote to in-person or blended to in-person uh, if things dramatically improve. Um, certainly while we all hope uh, that things dramatically improve, there's no plans to switch a course mode during the semester. Uh, unlike the March conversion, which was under, uh, under duress, we all had to scramble and convert uh, in the same way at the same time. Uh, here, all of the different course modes have been deliberately planned. And given the length of the semester and the likelihood of what it will take for things to get dramatically better with e.g. a vaccine, uh, it doesn't make sense to also be ready to suddenly uh, convert courses. So if a course is listed as being online or blended, uh, you can presume that it will be in, it's planned to be in that mode all semester. Okay, are there any other uh, live Q&A questions that need to be answered? Are we good? There's, there's an, a number of questions about uh, quarantining. There is an email communication that I believe is going out uh, within the next several days that will uh, specifically answer all of those uh, sort of health and safety uh, questions surrounding, uh, surrounding the quarantining and what will be available to students uh, 
who need to self quarantine. So um, look for an email uh, in the next uh, over the next few days. Uh, yeah, and um, I thought it would also be important to note that um, we're going to have a public health webinar next week. So any questions pertaining to public health and just like the general um, protocol for COVID, that'll be answered there as well. Um, and so I think we're running out of time. Um, and so I just wanted to say I'd like to thank um, Vice Provost Topico, Dean Jarrett, and Vice Provost Shirky for joining us today. And I'd like to thank everyone who was able to log on and participate. This webinar will be posted on the NYU Returns website so that anyone who missed it can view it. And a full transcript will also be available. Um, and when you go to the NYU Returns website, I encourage you all to visit the Idea Scale campaign as well. And you can contribute your ideas to make our return to the New York campus as safe and as effective as possible. And the campaign ends on Monday, July 27th. So please continue to check NYU Returns for the most up-to-date info about the fall 2020 semester. And just know if you have any extra questions that weren't pertaining to academics, which is what this webinar was specified for, um, all of those questions will be transferred and referred to our admin so that they'll be answered in future webinars. Um, and I just wanted to say everyone stay safe and enjoy the rest of your summer and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much.